Uh, and welcome to the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies West Side Story, uh, the Brooklyn Connection Lecture Series. What you were listening to uh, was Bobby Sanabria, Maestro Sanabria, uh, West Side Story Reimagined Somewhere. And so welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides to the Pearl's West Side Story Brooklyn Connection Lecture Series series offered by the course PEARLS, P-R-L-S, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies. Uh, we consider that uh, Brooklyn College is a treasure chest and we are the pearls of that treasure chest. And it's class 2105, New York Latinx Culture and the Arts. Please note that this session is being recorded. Uh, I am Dr. Maria Perez y Gonzalez. I am deputy chairperson and associate professor in the Department of Pearls. And I'd like to begin by saying that we do acknowledge that this is the unceded territory of the Lenape indigenous peoples. We need to learn about and commit ourselves to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. May we remember to uplift and honor indigenous ancestors each and every day. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited. Um, and so I'd like to just acknowledge a, a few people that are um, with us and that need to be uh, introduced, although you won't see them, I don't think, but uh, Dr. Alan Aha is the chairperson of Pearls. Uh, thank you for uh, your participation in this and for leading our department. Ms. Matilda Nistal, she is the Pearl's office goddess, <laughs> and so she helps us with our beautiful flyers and the virtual background that I have. And Mr. Alex Suarez, he is our tech assistant, and he is uh, in the Brooklyn College Graduate Performance and Interactive Media Arts program here. So thank you all for your help and assistance in this special program. This Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies course is offered as part of the Intercultural Competency Rubric in General Education at Brooklyn College. The focus is West Side Story, which I am teaching, with the centerpiece being the lecture series, uh, which Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral made possible. This course centers the 10-time Academy Award-winning film from 1961 as connected to the forthcoming December 2021 release on Friday of the version produced by Steven Spielberg, Tony Kushner, Christy Makosko Krieger, Kevin McConnell, and Rita Moreno. Our course explores the artistic and cultural impact of West Side Story through the lenses of the humanities and social sciences. Pearls is a part of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences highlighting topics of Puerto Rico's history with the United States of America, immigration, ethno-racial relations, gender, gangs, language, music, character analysis, and the like. Professor Emerita of Pearls and recipient of the 2020 Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Service in New York History, Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral, served as historical consultant to West Side Story 2021. And she is the Brooklyn College connection. She's also a Brooklyn College alum, class of 1960. When you see the reimagined film, listen for Virginia in the kitchen scene, and you will hear a small tribute to her. Dr. Sanchez Coral is my co-host and chaired the Department of Pearls from 1989 to 2004 and was founding president of the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Her numerous publications include From Colonia to Community, The History of Puerto Ricans in New York, and the three-volume Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia. Her forthcoming 2021 co-edited book, which we partnered together to produce, is entitled Puerto Rican Studies in the City University of New York. Uh, and so I want to just take a moment to share uh, the beautiful cover 
So I hope you can see that. It's a beautiful cover on, and we're covering the first 50 years, which was celebrated um, in 2020, 2021. And so uh, it's forthcoming. We're very excited about that. And so I, I really wanted to share that with you. Um, so uh, here together, uh, Dr. Sanchez, Coral and I uh, organized a lecture series of special guests connected with the film to share their expertise, experiences and insight for students as they move through the socio-historic background and artistry of West Side Story. Our first speaker uh, of the series was Dr. Sanchez Coral on the history of Puerto Rico and the United States and its Puerto Rican immigrant citizens. Next came Maestro Bobby Sanabria, a West Side Story reimagined album. Uh, he produced it and, and uh, that's his album. It's uh, wonderful. If you haven't seen it or heard it, uh, please do so. And served, he served on the community advisory board. The foremost playwright in the United States, Mr. Tony Kushner, was here with us and he wrote the screenplay for the new film. Dr. Ernesto Acevedo Munoz, who authored the book West Side Story as Cinema, and he served as a consultant, was also with us. Renowned journalist and author Juan Gonzalez, who grew up during the time of the first film, spoke to us about coalition building during the 1960s and gangs. Victor Cruz was here. He served as the dialect coach for the film, and he is creator of the animated Tita series, and he also has a role in the film where he chases the jets out of his bodega. Uh, and most recently, this past Monday, Maestra Janine Tesori, the most acclaimed female theatrical musical composer in the U.S., was with us. So each of our special guests, I, I want you to know, dedicated generously of their time and expertise. So it is my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, one of the most influential personalities in the history of cinema. Steven Spielberg is Hollywood's best known director. He has an extraordinary number of commercially successful and critically acclaimed num uh, credits to his name, either as a director, producer, or writer since launching the summer blockbuster with Jaws in 1975. And he is known to have done more to define popular filmmaking since the mid 70s than anyone else. Bear with me as I read some of the more well-known um, uh, films that he's been involved with. Um, many of us do know his work, but many of us know his work, especially the younger generation, through what we've seen, not necessarily that we know that he did that. So bear with me as I go through it. Um, he, um, his film, his next film after Jaws, was the classic UFO story, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, he began the famous series uh, Indiana Jones right, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. He produced and directed Poltergeist, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. In the 1980s, he produced The Goonies, Gremlins, An American Tale, and Back to the Future. As director, he took on The Color Purple and Empire of the Sun. He produced a landmark animation live-action film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and directed uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, as well as the animated series Tiny Toon Adventures, Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, and Toonsylvania. Spielberg also produced other cartoons such as The Lamb Before Time, the live action versions of Casper and the Flintstones. He directed Hook, produced such films as An American Tale, uh, Fievel Goes West, Arachnophobia, and the acclaimed Jurassic Park. He produced and directed Schindler's List for which he won Best Director and Best Picture at the Oscars. In the mid-90s, he helped found the production company DreamWorks. As a producer in the 1990s, he was responsible for such films as The Mask of Zorro, Men in Black, Deep Impact, and Transformers. He directed and produced Amistad and Saving Private Ryan. Spielberg also produced a series of films including The Haunting, Shrek, the miniseries Band of Brothers, and directed AI, Artificial Intelligence, War of the Worlds, The Legend of Zorro, Minority Report, Ready Player One, Munich, Lincoln, and now West Side Story, his very first musical. As our last speaker in the Pearl's West Side Story uh, lecture series, The Brooklyn Connection, we welcome Mr. Steven Spielberg. 
we are uh, we're, we're delighted that you're here, Mr. Spielberg. Uh, right. May I call you Stephen? Yeah, like you always have, please. Yeah. Do. <laughs> <laughs> that was Tony's answer also, but I figured this is a little bit more formal. Um, one of the questions that people have been asking uh, for a long time now, uh, given the, the given the numbers and the figures that we have for Latinos or Puerto Ricans in the industry, uh, is uh, that uh, the answers that we get to the to to why this is this this doesn't happen is because there aren't enough or there aren't any talented people out there. But you've just proven with West Side Story that there's an abundance of talent. So many of our of the, the young people in the cast, this is a first time experience for them. And those of us uh, behind the camera who were, who were at the advisory groups, for example, myself included, this is a, a, a first in, in, in our experience as well. So how, do we get rid of those stereotypes? How is it that we, I see West Side Story as opening doors. Uh, how do we open that door wider, uh, have a wider table, preferably a round table, so that decisions are, 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 are made uh, from, from all angles? And, and pretty much, you know, how do we get into that room, the room where things happen? The room where things happen. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, the cast, our cast of West Side Story is a real testament to the depth of talent, you know, yeah. in the Latinx community. And I would not have made West Side Story unless we were able to cast all the sharks with actors who had Latinx heritage. You know, we have, we have just to name a few, Anna Isabel, David Alvarez, Ariana DeBose. You know, um, there's 30 Latinx performers in our film 20 of Puerto Rican descent, and they're all to a person, astonishing talents. And, and you know, I, I think they, and also 20 of our cast members are Puerto Rican or from the diaspora. Uh, and, and this was a mandate that I laid down at the very beginning of making West Side Story with, with Christy McCosco, our amazing producer, Tony Kushner, and with, with very, very important, because I want to include her, is Sidney Tolan who cast the film. The thing that people don't understand about casting is the power of the casting director. The casting director is somebody who is the first person exposed to talent that has submitted their um, tapes or, or their Instagrams or, or anything on any feed that shows one of the three hats they possess. In this case, it was a very hard film to cast. We had, they had to act great, they had to sing, impossibly well and they had to dance uh, uh, and just dazzle with their dancing. They also had to just have a kind of personal commit charisma. So if they sit in the room and just look at the camera, we're still compelled to look at them and not look away. I mean, th these were really high requirements. But I said to Cindy at the very, very beginning, please only allow tapes shown to you and shown to me to come from the, from the global Latinx community. Um, and, and there were a lot of people who submitted their tapes uh, uh, from Spain, from Mexico, you know, from Buenos Aires. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. There were 32,000 submissions for, for only four roles in this film. Uh, um, uh, certainly, you know, um, two of whom, you know, uh, uh, Anita and Bernardo were Puerto Rican characters. Uh, so so this, was, this was in our DNA from the beginning. I was not trying to apologize for anybody else's productions of West Side Story. That's not in my purview, and that's not my responsibility. Um, I can only talk about how I feel in my contemporary time. I'm, I'm you know, I'm certainly aware of uh, the reputation Hollywood has for underrepresentation. Um, in, in the case of West Side Story, in the case of 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 films over the last, let's, let's say, 100 years, um, you know, the Lat Latinx audience is over-indexed among moviegoers. And this means that there's a huge audience not seeing themselves represented on screen. And they are starving, famished to see themselves represented. When Rita Morano first appeared in the 1961 West Side Story, 
that opened doors. That 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 inspired young Lat Latino girls to say, "Oh my God, that could be me someday," and that opened that did open a door, but it didn't open a door to a Hollywood soundstage. It opened the door and simply raised the awareness. What we hope happens with West Side Story is that door gets kicked open a little wider. No one can say just how wide that door can get kicked over, uh, kicked open with a lot of consolidated solidarity among all these communities with a determinism to get this job done and create opportunities for the underrepresented uh, Latino audience and those who are desperate to show off their culture, their art, what they have to offer as storytellers. And, and I hope this isn't too long of an answer. <laughs> um, no. But, but um, you know, I, I think it's important that we, I think we've done some good work just going into this. Um, I think behind the camera, you got to start looking at the great organizations, you know, that are, that, are, that, are, that are working hard to improve the pipeline, like the Ghetto Film School, you know, the National Association of, of Latino Independent Producers, NALIP, and, and, and the Made in New York Production Assistant Training Program, all, all, all of which do very, very, very good work. And we actually dip into these wells to, and, and to, to hire production assistants and people to work behind the camera on West Side Story. Um, we took people from Puerto Rico to work behind the camera as well as in front of the camera on West Side Story. Uh, but we can't do it alone. And if West Side Story can inspire the people that tell these stories and say yes to money spent to make movies, you know, limited television series, network series. It's not just the movie industry we're, we're addressing. We're addressing the entire cultural heritage of our motion picture and television history. Yeah, along those lines, um, can you speak to any initiatives that you yourself have either begun or are involved with uh, to form a cadre, right, of, of Latinx uh, and other peoples of color uh, to become a great filmmaker, uh, to work alongside you or to shadow you in any way, um, somehow to write, to bring these people to the table. Because uh, as Virginia had pointed out, right, it's difficult to do that. And some, some people don't even know how to begin. So I wonder if you have been involved with any uh, kinds of initiatives that could help, um, right, uh, bring the underrepresented communities uh, into directing, into Hollywood, into you know working alongside you, learning from the great Steven Spielberg. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it starts with a check. You all know that. We all know that starts with 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 financial support. We have financially supported Amblin, my company, and the Disney Corporation. That, you know, made a contribution to the Ghetto Film School. Um, uh, we work through Latino Lens, which is part of Nali in order to um, you know, find the next generation of, 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 of producers because they have a tremendous training program there. They offer an active eight week sort of hands-on learning um, experience. Um, and they also, uh, uh, be able, they're also able to take membership and line them up with mentorship programs with producers actively working on television and film productions. So, the, so this is how, this is sort of how it all begins. And um, you know what? What really, what really, you know, needs needs to happen is there needs to be more stories that invite these very talented communities to have more opportunities. Because you know, I always say it's got to be on on the page before it's on the stage. <laughs> you know, it's and and that means writers uh, that 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 do not underrepresent but completely represent such a vast minority. Of, of, of Hispanic and Latino talent in this country, um, you know, including characters, um, uh, you know, th this is a very, very important step that's taken. So this is where the hand and glove part of uh, a, a kind of proactive cooperation between community and industry uh, ha has, to, has to occur. And we are always doing that inside my company, inside, inside Amble Entertainment. We are we are very very focused on 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 you know a high degree of representation. Some of these are best kept secrets, like the organizations you've mentioned. I think I might have heard of one of them. <laughs> how can we try to spread that word? Right? How how can we make that more public? 
Well, you, you, you make things just basically more public by talking about them. That's really the only way to do it. It's like what, what we're doing right now. It's kind of like pay it forward. You know, somebody, somebody reports on something that it's some initiative that, that, that is, is, is established to expand the opportunities for under, underrepresented communities. And that just puts the word out. The Directors Guild of America does fantastic work in inclusivity and representation. Um, I think the Directors Guild of America is probably the most the most proactive group that's actually seeking and creating mentorships, um, and uh, and I'm very proud of that. I'm I'm a governor on on the uh, national board of the Directors Guild of America, and I and I've been a governor now for seven or eight years, and I've, I've, I've there's a lot of proactivity happening right now in exactly what we're talking about through the Directors Guild program, where you where mentorship programs are being offered. Uh, and there's also training training programs being offered to young third assistant, second assistant directors, and just production assistants. You know, you got to start somewhere. I didn't start as a production assistant, but I did a PA job for the for the great independent filmmaker John Cassavetes. I got kicked around a lot. Nobody was nice to me except John. But um, I learned I learned a lot. I learned a lot about about trauma drama because John really was more of, of like a, a tough drill instructor combined with a very sensitive therapist to get performances out of his actors. I, I learned more from watching John than I did from sort of watching a television show being shot at Universal when I was a kid sneaking onto the lot years ago. And, and that is called mentorship. And uh, these opportunities are out there. You know, this was, that leads us right into the, the next question. And uh, that is that, uh, uh, we are really grateful that you're making an enormous contribution of your time and generosity to the college, to the department. You know, our students uh, cannot be what they cannot see. So mentorship uh, is very important. And I was wondering if you could say something uh, about how you got started in the business. And, uh, and what you did, because there are all kinds of, of weird stories about how you got started in the business. You climbed the bus, you, you, you hid out in a bathroom somewhere when the bus left and stuff like that. What's the, how, how did you do that? I'm only shaking my head because those are all true stories. They're not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I did take the Universal Studio Tour when I was in high school in Arizona and was staying yeah. with second cousins in Canoga Park. I did take a tour those days. It wasn't a tram, it was a bus called the Gray Lines Tour, right. Gray Lines Tour. And I got on a bus and uh, it was very frustrating because I only had a window to look out of and, and it was very stuffy in there and I couldn't see anything. And we were given a bathroom break and it's true, I went to the bathroom and it's true, I never came out of the bathroom until I knew the bus had moved on without me. That's how, how old I, are you? Wait, how old were you? Oh God, I was about that... seven, 16, 16 years old maybe. Oh my I God. High, I was a high school student, <laughs> Arcadia High School in Phoenix, Arizona. And I yeah. came out to visit a second cousin, my parents' second cousin, and, yeah. and that's how it all started. Um, and I, at that point, every summer I came back to Universal and snuck onto the lot and was sort of an unofficial observer. So in a sense, Universal Studios was my mentor. 450 acres at Universal City was my mentor. That's how I did my mentorship. But also mentorship means individuals that take a personal interest in your contributions and your future. And that is a one-on-one -on -one thing. There's great programs, but when you find someone who is willing to take you under their arm and, and, and share their magic, you know, a magician never shares their tricks except to young apprentice magicians. And I think that anybody that wants to be into this business, we should consider them young apprentice magicians. And yes, it's fine to share your tricks. And, um, and I just remember people. I remember the names of the people that were nice to me. Uh, in a very professional, fast-moving industry that didn't stop to make small talk with some kid with acne running around the universal lot trying to pretend he was older than he was so I wouldn't get thrown off. But there were people that were very kind to me. And, uh, and I'm not going to bore you by mentioning all their names, but I'll mention one name. There was a man named Chuck Silvers. And when I went, when I hid in the bathroom and then got out of the bathroom and spent the day looking all around universal, I had to get a ride back to Canoga Park and I looked for a phone to make a phone call. And I just walked into the first door I found. It was said Universal Film Library. I walked into the door and there was a 
secretary behind her desk and she asked me what I was doing there and I told her my story and she started laughing so it was really funny she said you got to be my boss and she went and knocked on a door and this nice man came out named Chuck Silvers and I told him the story and he thought it was just great and he said so you want to be a director and I said yes and he said I'll tell you what I do I'll do I only have the authority I can write you a three-day pass so you don't have to sneak onto the lot you can come back the next three days after that mm -hmm. I can't write you any more passes you have to meet somebody else who will write you the next pass and he wrote me a three-day pass that was probably the biggest break I ever had it, it, being so in love with wanting to be part of this business and uh after three days I took a chance because I had waved at the guard Scotty every day for those three days <laughs> on the fourth day I took a chance that he wouldn't go like this and say let me see your pass and I waved to Scotty and Scotty who was Scottish with a big smile on his face waved back to me when when, when I won my first Oscar uh, uh for Schindler's List uh, Scotty was still the guard at the gate, albeit much, much older. I had a miniature Oscar made for Scotty, and I went over to the guard kiosk, and I gave him the little miniature, miniature, miniature unofficial Oscar, and I said, I wouldn't have won that if you hadn't let me into there. So, Scotty, thank you. And, um, and, and that is just by way of saying you should always remember the people that help you, and you should always be grateful, but you should absolutely be ambitious and don't be shy because if you're if, if you have a dream you have to work to achieve the dream dreams only come true in walt disney movies they don't come true without a lot, lot of hard work <laughs> okay korea uh, well as its primary creator right what are you most proud of in west side story what would you want to change and how did the delay of a year help or harm the movie well the delay of the year really helped the movie in 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 this sense number one had we decide had we released the film like so many other film companies were releasing their massive motion picture productions on their own streaming self services mm -hmm. to the to the to the credit of bob Iger, alan horn and alan bergman the three people that run primarily disney ran disney um uh for years when they saw the movie in 2019 it was finished um and we were all in quarantine we were all not leaving our homes because of covid and everybody else was taking their films and putting them on you know hbo and 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 disney plus and that sort of thing bob and the bob said and the two allens said this needs to be seen on the big screen this is a motion picture theatrical experience mm -hmm. this, this this yes people will see it on the smaller screen eventually, but we want to give this film every single chance. Let's wait a year. Let's not put it on Disney Plus. Let's wait a year and come out in motion picture theaters, which is where it was intended to first be experienced. And that was that was something that I'll never forget. I'll never forget them for that. They had the right to put it on Disney Plus. They didn't do it because they honored the film. They wanted the and they honored the motion picture theatrical experience. That's the most important thing. Um, uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't ever th consider what, what I look, looking back on movies, whether I did something right or did something wrong. You know, I, I need a distance between the experience and the reaction and my own reaction to the experience and the reaction. That's a question I can answer in two or three years. I'm just so proud of the work it, in this film, because the most beautiful thing about this picture is that we all became a family. We became, you know, they, they call it a company. On, on stage in theater you call it a company i'd never made a musical before ever i didn't even know i'd be any good at it i just knew i loved the idiom and the genre of the, the the musical and west side story to me is the greatest musical ever written for the broadway stage bar none for me that's just how i've always felt about it since i was 10 years old when i first heard the original broadway cast album that my parents brought home in 1957 i was 10 or 11 when i first heard it um, so if I was going to make a musical, it was only going to be West Side Story. And, and because I felt when I got serious nine years ago about seeking the rights and seeing if I could meet Stephen Sondheim and auditioning my version of West Side Story to him and the other three estates, um, I didn't know what they were going to say, but I did know that the relevance of that story, not just the Romeo and Juliet aspect, which inspired Jerome Robbins to hire and co collaborate with Bernstein, Arthur Lawrence, who wrote the book, and eventually Sondheim. 
but you know, it, Romeo and Juliet isn't about race it, it, and, and, and xenophobia. And there's so much of that in our West Side Story. I felt the time had come 60 years later that this, this, this story, this great story with so much critical message would not fall on deaf ears and would be probably received with more ability to hear and to reflect about our society today, albeit in a film that takes place in 1957, but the characters are so rich and detailed by Tony Kushner and they're so sort of interpersonal and complicated the way people are. It would speak to this generation and get young people who, by the way, have never even heard of West Side Story until now. Hopefully it will get young people to find value in this story in 2021. Well, from everything that we have heard, we've, we've now seen the movie. I've seen it twice. Maria has seen it twice. Uh, I just got a note from someone else who said, I went with my class. We saw it again. I, I like it much better the more I see it, the more I find in it. And from the conversations that we've been having uh, with, uh, you know, uh, people doing interviews and stuff and want, wanting to know more, uh, every time one of us talks about it, there's just so much richness in it. Uh, oh, I didn't remember this. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, in my house, we right. always spoke in English and Spanish. That was right. how it was. Right. Uh, right. Uh, up until the time when, when, when I, in my case, I began to speak to my parents in English, and they kept answering me in Spanish. <laughs> so, um, so this becomes. I know Janine also referred to it as a common experience in an ethnic household uh, that is not uh, so removed yet from uh, from its roots. I, I, and, I experienced that, Virginia. I grew up in a household yeah. that spoke Yiddish and Russian. Um, yeah. um, my grandparents spoke Yiddish and Russian and English, but Yiddish and Russian was their first language. And mm -hmm. so I know what it's like not to understand something. And then with repetition, completely understand it without having to know the language. Right, right. And that's what's happening. Uh, one of the big uh, uh, kudos for the film is the fact that you didn't put in subtitles. I was, I was, uh, that was very intentional. It would have, yes. I, felt, I felt that subtitling West Side Story would have doubled down on the English and put English in a vastly superior uh, commentary against the, the Spanish language. And there's all there's already so much pushback in this country about Spanish speak, speak speaking um, um, individuals that I, I I just said we can't do that. We and I don't and I love watching the film with an audience as we did in New York at the premiere and all the laughter from Spanish speaking members of the audience in places yes, who that got no it. <laughs> was laughing, but the laughing was contagious and got them to sort of everybody else to understand what, what yeah. the laugh was about. Yeah. I, I, I just think it's just out of respect, you know, you know, that we did not put uh, subtitles on West Side Story. Well, one of our students um, from Brooklyn College's Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema, Mayra Gutierrez is asking, has there been any backlash about that decision and that artistic vision that that did not provide the subtitles? Have you received any of that? No, no, I haven't. There's, there's been just been a lot. There's been a lot of preoccupation, not about why we did it, but about the value of it and the respect that comes from the filmmakers, the writer, uh, and all the cast that we were, and also the naturalism in a Spanish in a in, in a in a household where the first language is Spanish. And yet a character like Anita is trying to assimilate. She's chasing down the American dream. And she's telling everybody in her house, Maria and her, and, to, and, 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 and uh, Bernardo, she's always reminding them, speak English. She's saying, hey, I'm here to stay, speak English. Um, <laughs> the, the other two, Maria and, 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 and Bernardo, aren't sure if they're staying. Um, um, but the thing to remember is that um, it, it, it's just so natural. And I heard it growing up so natural to start in English and then fall into your first language and then catch yourself and fall back into English. And, and that's how Tony wrote the script. And he did, he did it liberally throughout the entire film. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the big shocks that I had when I read the script that, that first 
that first day. Well, my no, no, the second shock. The first shock was that right. Tony asked me if I would read the script. <laughs> but the, the, uh, when I came to La Borinquena, which a lot of people are, are questioning, uh, they're questioning the role of, of, of that song. Uh, we spoke about this with Janine yesterday too. Uh, the role of the song in the movie and whether uh, it, did, it, did it fit. And I said, you know, my first reaction when I read it was, oh, wow, this is fantastic. But wait a minute. How does this kid Bernardo get to know that? How does he know about that song? That's those are revolutionary words. How is it that he comes to that? I, I confronted Tony. And uh, Tony immediately said, I have back, I have back stories. <laughs> all the characters <laughs> look at the backstories yeah. and then you realize very very quickly on not only not only is Aborinquena the revolutionary words important but they're fighting urban renewal they're fighting for their turf they're fighting for their land yes. or what they, they're fighting for that little piece of dirt uh that is going to be taken over and so um so I so so thank you because I have people going back to look at the history and, and they're saying, and I'm calling out the fact that the flag is light blue. Okay, why is the flag light blue? We go into discussions like that. Right. And right. Uh, those are the things that are in the film that lead to greater understanding because you do have to pay attention. You do have to go back and say, oh, okay, this is what happened. Now I understand. I think so, understanding, understanding yeah. certainly creates respect and respect encourages research. And, yeah. and Tony researched and I researched, but really Tony did the research. And we, 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 we certainly went to San Juan and I had been in, in San Juan several times before I made a movie in Puerto Rico uh, called Amistad. And, um, um, and just a rich, rich cultural environment. And, and uh, you know, we went there, we spoke at the university there and, um, and there was pushback uh, three years ago when we went to Puerto Rico because, uh, you know, there, there was pushback on why are we doing West Side Story again? It, it has it has not really treated us well uh, it, over the years. Um, and and I was I I was I wanted to say just wait and watch our film, but we hadn't made the film yet. But we did have a great screenplay by Tony Kushner, and I just couldn't wait for them to see it. Um, uh, I think it's important to also note that. Uh, Every character in this film is nuanced. Every single shark, every single jet has backstory. They are nuanced. So Bernardo staking his claim and defending his country and standing up and singing the Borcano is something that makes him a very, very strong character to be respected and to be dealt with fairly. And because all these characters have very deep roots, and these were designed in the screenplay and the backstories every single actor was given about their characters. And you know, and you never see the roots, but the tree grows stronger and it sprouts more, more, more leaves when you've got deep, healthy roots. And that was the other thing that is not on the surface and you won't see it the first time you see the movie. But if you see the movie more than once, you're gonna see much more backstory that isn't immediately apparent on the screen but when you wonder why are these characters so much more three-dimensional than my memory of, of other West Side Story productions, it's because every single person who played any character in West Side Story knew who they, where they came from and they, they knew who they were. One of our students, Michael Lazaro, uh, asks, what was the toughest challenge you faced while making West Side Story? Well, the toughest challenge I made was I had never made a musical before. I mean, that was the toughest challenge. It was a personal internal struggle constantly because I'm such a lover of musicals. And I quickly discovered that just by loving musicals doesn't mean you can direct one. And, and I had to go, uh, I had to go uh, on a very, very, you know, sort of personal uh, uh, journey, but certainly surrounded by the best of the best to help me on my journey. It was a steep learning curve for me. Um, and I had to figure out how do I use these two tools, these two tremendous assets I've never had to use before to tell a complete story. One is dance and one is, 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 is song, libretto, especially a boy like that, which is as close to opera as West Side Story ever gets. Um, and and, and I, I decided early on, instead of 
requiring Broadway to help me make this movie by saying, come to Hollywood Broadway and, and conform to our standards, the way we tell stories. I kind of threw myself on the mercy of the Broadway stage experience of a Tony Award winning uh, a writer like like Tony Kushner and 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 Janine, Janine Tesori and Justin Peck and Paul Taswell who did the costumes, and also did the costumes for, for Hamilton when it debuted on Broadway. It was very very important that I go back to school, and in a sense I uh, be, uh, that I uh, that I be accompanied by those in this genre that have sung and danced for a living and knew exactly what they were doing. And once I decided to let them teach me, they mentored me as we're talking about mentorship until I felt I was really ready after five months of rehearsal to take on this huge assignment and this passion project, which has been in my heart since I was 10, 11 years old. There's okay. another question from uh, Paulina Weber. Uh, she's a directing candidate. So this is a little more technical, I guess, um, right up your alley. Mm -hmm. She's interested in knowing how did you make a shot list when you were filming dance numbers to avoid making everything too frontal? How did you decide? Did you watch the rehearsals and select camera positions and then storyboard? Did you work with Justin Peck to choreograph around camera movements, pan, tilt, dolly, etc.? Uh, did he himself choreograph knowing, um, okay, this is going to be a crane shot? <laughs> so that's more uh, precise. <laughs> Well, before any choreograph, before any of the choreography was designed by Justin Peck, always, always, you know, using the inspiration of the great Jerome Robbins, who changed American dance forever. Um, uh, I storyboarded a lot of the dance numbers, and sometimes I storyboarded the dance numbers in front of Justin. I would go up to the Lincoln Center uh, um, next to Juilliard, where he had an office, and I would go into his office with his his now wife, but then assistant choreographer you know, Patricia Delgado. And I would sit there and just put on the original Broadway cast album. We only used, by the way, we didn't use the 61 movie square. We used always the original cast right. album. And I just started storyboarding it. And what was interesting, because I storyboard a lot of my films, especially action movies, the thing that I realized was this: there's a lot of math in musicals. And there, you have to know how to count. Now, luckily, I played clarinet for 12 years. My mom's, my mom was an accomplished concert pianist. So I've had, you know, music training growing up in New Jersey and Arizona, Northern California, all my life. And that really served me well. I can't sing and I can't dance, but I got a pretty good ear for music. Um, mm -hmm. So everything was about the math of it all. I, I suddenly was constrained by the tempi of the score. I had to stop here because that's where the rest happens or, or, or that's where a new bar begins. And it was really interesting. And that's two, four time, that's four, four time. It, it, it was really an interesting new set of prerequisites that I had to learn about. Some of I already knew intuitively, other things I really had to learn about. So when I would set up a shot, it was also based on storyboard. So here's what I did. This is the best way to answer the question. I didn't know if I'd be any good at this. So I made all these storyboards of dance numbers. Let's, let's say it's Officer Krupke as an example. And I did like 50, 60 storyboards for Officer Krupke. Then I videoed with my phone each of the storyboards. And then I put the music to, 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 to the storyboard. So we cut the storyboards to the score. And so when you, when you suddenly heard action singing, you would go into a medium shot of action. That would be a storyboard. And it would really give us a good idea, just black and white, really badly hand draw drawings. And I hired a good storyboard artist to, to actually do the storyboards behind me. He'd see my stick figures and he'd fill them in and do it professionally. But I photographed these, put music to them. And it's amazing how much I learned just by doing that. But then the next iteration of my learning curve was to go to Dumbo, where we, re we rehearsed most of the dance numbers in Brooklyn. And um, as Justin was putting these numbers up on their feet, I would take my video camera and I would basically shoot angles on the numbers and then cut that together to the music and preview what that musical number might look like on video, which I handheld myself. And if I wanted to get a dolly shot, they put me on a chair with casters and they push the chair through the dancers. There were so many collisions. I cannot tell you how many times legs <laughs> kicked me in the back of the head or an elbow would get me in the side and my ribs. I go home with bruises 
because I was trying to put the camera inside the dancing, not as that wonderful person who asked that very interesting question uh, alluded to. I didn't want to be shooting this. I didn't want the camera to be facing the proscenium. I wanted to be on stage with the, with, with, with the dancers. So all the musical numbers are thought, are, were, were shot that way. And each number is different because each number has a character that stands on its own, uh, even before it, 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 it gives way to the next scene or is introduced by the last scene. Um, each number has a different design and a, and a kind of different purpose. And so it was probably the, the hardest job I've had in many, many years and also the most rewarding. Fantastic. That's great. That's a good, that's a good, a good lesson. So I'm glad that we have it on tape. That's okay. A good one. Yeah. It doesn't apply to everybody. Everybody will have their own. Tape no, every, exactly, exactly. Everybody but it's important it to know. It's important to know how different people uh, will, will, you know, will deal with a different situation. All of it is creative. All of it is going to come out of that, that person's yeah creativity and talent exactly uh, so so that's very very good um maria you had another one yes uh did you consider at any point taking it out of the 1950s and making it more current right to, to sort of bring it up to speed so that's that's a question i know many people have yeah that's a great question i've, I've been asked a question before and the, the simple reason is to have said it today would have politicized it uh, and basically completely uh, kind of hijacked the themes, the story, the, the, the joy and the tragedy. There, there's, 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 there's not as much joy today as there was in the mid 50s in a kind of more naive period of time. And the lyrics by Stephen Sondheim are in the idiom of the 1950s, not today. And we didn't want to change a single word of lyrics. We, we you know, St Stephen adjusted America so it would be respectful of Puerto Rico, but 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 we didn't want to change anything beyond the adjustment that uh, Stephen did for America for our for our film, and 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 the other thing is, audiences could very very easily see themselves today in a story that that that, that plays sixty four years ago. That's a very easy adjustment. Well, for us who grew up in that era, <laughs> we thank you for showing what the nineteen fifties looked like. That was important, uh, and it was important to keep the to 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 keep it to that particular time period because the issues then, while they reflected in the issues of today, are issues that very very few people were aware of. So um, the issues that the issues yeah. that were that, that were 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 basically issues of xenophobia, a word that was never used then, of course. Right. But it was issues of race and right. and, and and certainly. Uh, because it was only a few years after that where, where civil rights began to you know take take hold through Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, uh, Johnson, and Martin Luther King, and many others. Um, but um, if you if you said it today, uh, it wouldn't be a divide of a neighborhood. It would be a divide of a state, of a district, of a of a, of, 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 of an entire country that is more divided today than it ever dreamed of being in 1957. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one question that, that comes to mind is that, right, Puerto Ricans in particular, but Latinx is in general, is sort of a, a love-hate relationship with West Side Story, and, and you uh, alluded to that a little bit early on. Um, but, right, so, so some of the Puerto Ricans uh, say that, wow, this is amazing, we actually saw ourselves in this film, uh, and in this new one, uh, I guess the, the larger response will be after it comes out on Friday. Um, but for those who've seen it, right, I do uh, identify with many of the things in the film itself. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, I don't get to see that as a Puerto Rican in, in films and movies. And so I'm, I'm in love with West Side Story on the one hand, like many other Puerto Ricans. And then on the other hand, it's like, wait a minute, you know, it, it's showing us again in a negative light. So it's sort of a, a love-hate relationship, right? And so I know that you, right, you're going to get more of those questions uh, starting Friday, right, when it opens up to a larger audience. Um, so what are your thoughts about this sort of, it's sort of, uh, we love West Side Story, and at the same time, please give us more stories that, that have many more positive things in it, and, and sort of, so how do you deal with that? Well, I deal with it just by basically being honest about who these characters are to each other. You have to understand something that the, the Jets in our film 
are fourth generation white immigrants right. who don't have jobs and are basically juvenile delinquents. And they're living, you know, hand to mouth as a gang with, with just support within the gang. But a lot of them are orphaned and they're, 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 a lot of them don't have money. Then you've got the, the sharks. All the, all the sharks have jobs. They're, they're here in this country to, to work and they have honest, uh, good jobs. Chino is studying about how to, how to, how to be an adding machine repair person. Right. <laughs> you know? and, and, it, and even Bernardo says when he's challenged to, to rumble by Riff, he says, look, we can't play in, in your playground. We've got jobs. So you've got a representation of a Puerto Rican community all here through the diaspora, uh, 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 some here, some also already New Yorkans, who are here uh, making a living and sending money back to, to, to Puerto Rico. And you've got the Jets, they're juvenile delinquents. And if you really look at the story, the, the sharks do not start the rumble. They don't suggest the rumble. They don't start this. In the song that is, is commonly referred to as the quintet, and, and Stephen Sondheim kept saying, stop calling it that. They've been calling it that for 64 years. It's a quartet. But in any case, during that song, you know, the one gang says, well, they began it. And the other gang says, well, they began it. Well, clearly, it's the Jets that began it. And the sharks are defending themselves. That's a big change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, yeah, one of the, um, I, I hope that we can see um, many more stories of Puerto Ricans and Latinxes in the movies. Um, I, I look forward to that day. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and the Puerto Rican community, by the way, right, is also saying, Maria is not Puerto Rican. Like, oh no, another 60 years we have to wait. <laughs> But she does do a beautiful job of singing, um, and and I I enjoy That's... the music. It's it is um, beautiful to see. Uh, the cinematography is amazing. And if you have another uh, moment for a question, another technical question, <laughs> then I, I'll ask you another question that a student has. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the second part to that question, the technical question: How did you then handle the transitions from dance? back to narrative while maintaining the rhythm of the dramatic beat so it doesn't become choppy. And I, I do say that, you know, in the gym scene, I really was wondering how you captured that because the dancers are going back and forth and you explained that you got beat up <laughs> while doing that. But that was amazing. I really enjoyed how uh, they were so close. And then, you know, they, they're still looking at each other, Maria and Tony, uh, while everything is going on. Uh, so that's that's one of the yeah. questions. Yeah, and, and, and just a minute, that reflects, that going back and forth reflects uh, the, uh, the the sharks and the jets in, in shadow. Well, that shot that you, you do from, uh, from overhead as they're coming, you've got this kind of movement again. Right. So well, it's, a, a it's fascinating. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Let me just quickly go to, go to that observation, yeah. Virginia. And that is that, you know, the, the, when I designed the high shot with the shadows, I did it just on paper as, as I storyboarded. And I don't, I don't think, I don't do things symbolically. I, I, I do things literally that I find the symbolism later. Um, right. But that was one shot that I did as a statement because I wanted to show, we don't know who are the jets and who are the sharks because in the shadow, you can't tell them apart. So for a split second, you see uh, the anonymity of these shadows that, would, that creates tremendous equality in that one moment before then the, 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 the sources of the shadows enter the frame and then you see who they are. That was very, very important for me. Um, but yeah. also, uh, you know, you talked about not making it choppy. Uh, that, a lot of that was Tony Kushner's script. One of the first things Stephen Sondheim said when I showed him the movie finished in February of this year, he saw it with his husband, Jeff. And, um, and he, said, he said to me, what the, one of the best compliments he said was, he said, um, I, 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 I wrote, I, I know the score and I know this play intimately and I didn't know what was going to happen next. That was, there was no greater compliment that he could have given, yeah. given us on this production. I, the, I've, what, I've heard that, yes, from many people. But yeah. one of the th things he said was, he said, you know, I loved how you and Tony, and I give credit to Tony, 
um, created these runways. So the songs don't appear in the narrative just because somebody triggers the song with one line or two lines, but an entire scene was constructed that then was played out musically. But first you got to hear it in dialogue. And, 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 and probably the scene that comes to mind that exemplifies that more than any other scene is the scene the next morning after the balcony scene between uh, Tony and Maria where she comes into the kitchen and uh, they're talking about, uh, they're basically having an argument, you know, Anita and Bernardo are arguing about who, you know, about the, the relative value of staying in America and perhaps assimilating or only working here and then eventually going back to Puerto Rico. An entire scene about that family dynamic that gave Maria her first chance to have a real voice in her life and declare her independence from her brother. And all of this, which is a scene, four and a half minute scene in itself, invites the song America. It's not invited by four lines of dialogue and now it's time for another musical number, but the superstructure of the script is that the songs uh, are, are only by invitation and not and, and not by the fact that we are compelled to use every single song that was originally written 64 years ago in West Side Story, which we, by the way, we did use every song. Nothing was left out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, at Anita's part, um, I really enjoyed that she was much more fully developed. Uh, you can see her transitions. You can see her pain when she loses Bernardo. Um, and I thought that was so well done. Ariana DeBose did a, a really terrific job um, in transitioning through all yeah. those kinds of emotions. So yeah. I thought that was important, uh, yes. particularly mm -hmm. for what was going on uh, in the film at the time. And I think it's very important that she was Afro-Latina. -Lati it was very, very yeah. important. By the way, that was not a prerequisite for getting the part. You know, she got the part and, 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 and because, you know, she's of Puerto Rico, she's of Puerto Rican descent. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, it, uh, on her father's side, uh, and that wasn't a reason she got the part either. She one reason was that she was Latinx. Um, it was because she was a great actor, and and was a great dancer and was a fabulous singer. She really earned, you know, the, the right to play Anita and her abiding deep love for Rita Moreno's Anita in the 1961 West Side Story which she always referred to as that wonderful woman, that wonderful girl in the purple dress. Now she can play Anita in the yellow dress. <laughs> and <laughs> and they, they, they really liked each other. Both yeah. Rita and Ari Ari Ariana really liked each other. Yeah. So, so how was it working with Rita Moreno? I mean, right, being part of that 60 years ago and now again, it's, it's and that she was written into it through the part of Valentina is is really uh, something else how was it working with her you know i love working with her you know it's like it's like you know working with her is is like I, when i was younger i used to off-road i used to ride dirt bikes motorcycles off-road and um and so i'm only using that analogy because working with her is like being off-road you know <laughs> it's, it's it's like working with somebody who doesn't know uh, a stop sign from a red light because she won't be stopped and she's, she, yeah. and she looks both ways before crossing, but she's got to always be going forward. Yeah. She has such a joie de vie. She has such a commitment to her life and to loving people and to representing Puerto Rico and, 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 and the whole New York Rican community. And all the dues she had to pay, if you watch her documentary and read her book and you'll see yeah. the kind of, she laid, she laid on barbed wire a lot so a lot of la la Latina young girls can both be inspired and, and, and have opportunities to show their talent. And, and she was just a, a, a fierce, proactive human being to the entire cast and crew on our movie and a real divining rod. And that's why I made her executive producer. And, and I just didn't hire her to be Valentina. She was the best Valentina I could find, by the way. But it was it was because I knew she was going to create a solidarity inside the cast, and she would was going to come during rehearsals and talk to us about her life, and what it was like, you know, being Puerto Rican and what it was and what it was, and 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 what it was and how hard that was in this country for so many decades, and uh, she gave everybody a real sense of community. So, 
there was a lot of reasons she's with us. Mm -hmm. yeah, yesterday, I'm sorry, and yesterday's screening for the, at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, there was a special screening of West Side Story, and she gave a little personal message via a video, and everybody clapped. And when she finished singing in West Side Story, everybody clapped. Everybody oh, clapped. Yeah. Very <laughs> That's yeah. great to hear. Yeah. That's great. So I, I, I just want to thank you. I, this is working with you and working on this movie has been a highlight. <laughs> now, if I had known about this before I became a historian, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody told me I didn't have any access. And uh, <laughs> if I had known. <laughs> wow. You, you, you were a mitzvah, as we say. You were a mitzvah to all of us. It was such an honor working with you, and you came oh, you. on board, and you, and, you, and you made us, you continued to make us vigilant and aware of our responsibility to this uh, you know, time-worn classical story in trying to keep it authentic and keep it honest and keep it respectful to not just mm -hmm. the, the Latin, Latinx communities all over the world, but to the Puerto Rican community itself. And you were just so vigilant with us. And thank yeah. you for your honesty. You didn't blink and you weren't intimidated by me or Tony or anybody. And I love that about you. <laughs> and Maria, thank you so much for such good questions and for such yeah. an enjoyable time talking to, to you and everybody who will see this in Brooklyn. Yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, thank you. On behalf of the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies and my course, uh, New York Latino Latinx Culture and the Arts, uh, we thank yeah. you from Brooklyn College, CUNY. We thank you for your time, your generosity, your expertise, and be well. And, and I hope that many more future endeavors uh, will take us to places where we can see Puerto Rican Latinxes in all sorts of movies. Uh, and and hear the stories. The hear stories, the stories. Are, there are so many the stories. stories. You hear this. I completely yes. agree. I completely agree. Yeah. And, 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 and start developing you know, Puerto Rican directors to tell those, help tell those Puerto Rican stories. Right. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Be well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Sanchez Coral, who just has a few uh, closing remarks, since this is the last in our series. Um, Dr. Sanchez Coral. Uh, I, I first want to thank this lovely audience that uh, kept writing in while we were talking because uh, I, I loved how you were receiving the, uh, the, the information, the work that we, we did. Uh, you, were, you were right. Uh, it was pre-taped yesterday morning because uh, Mr. Spielberg didn't want to be left out of the, of, of the lecture series. He said from the very, very beginning that he would be part of it. And as it happened, uh, he was in California. And so we, uh, we asked our students, uh, this is a class, remember, we, we asked our students and, uh, and those participants that have been uh, joining us uh, since September for the lecture series, uh, we asked them for questions. And uh, our students uh, uh, consist of not only undergrad students, but graduate students in theater and music. And, um, and on Monday, we were fortunately, uh, fortunate enough to be able to interview Janine Tesori, uh, who spoke a great deal about the importance of, of, of her role in the film, in making the film. And, and told us more about uh, her, her, she's a foremost composer, uh, a former conductor, uh, uh, told, told us a great deal about the importance of, of the voice. I know one of the questions was uh, from today's audience, uh, were any of the singers dubbed? Not one was dubbed. Uh, one of the prerequisites was that they had to come in able to sing um, and to sing well. And we talked about the fact that the music is very operatic and what that meant. So if you want to know more about that, you, when we edit uh, Janine Tesori's uh, video, you'll be able to get the answers. In the meantime, uh, before we sign off, I want to thank Maria Perez y Gonzalez for the wonderful work 
and and the excitement and the joy that uh, doing this lecture series has been for us. Uh, we've had a chance to work both on the book uh, during the pandemic year and uh, now with the lecture series. And the greatest thing is, yes, Maria, you're amazing. <laughs> Somebody just wrote in, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nicest things about it is that I, I come off from, you know, from the street with a, a night, hey, let's do a lecture series because I've met these enormously wonderful people who would like to contribute to our efforts to widen that table, to bring in directors and screen uh, writers and playwrights uh, to begin to open the path for our students. And she said, yeah, let's do it. And then we realized we didn't know how to do it because we had never done anything like this before. And it meant having to learn uh, how to work with Zoom. Um, I have to thank you for that, and uh, and that and 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 the fact that these uh, that the series will remain available to teachers and faculty members and students uh, for for as long as you're interested, because it will be on our website. And I guess the other the um, the other people that I want to thank would be the participants. Uh, we thought when we started to talk about the lecture series, um, uh, we couldn't talk about the film. We couldn't talk about the 2021 film because we couldn't, I couldn't really say anything about it. And, um, and so we came up with the idea of looking at West Side Story over time from 1957 leading up to the 2021 release. And, uh, and that gave us an opportunity to bring in uh, people who were conversant in those, on those themes and those areas. So this has been almost like the development of West Side Story from the beginning up until this point in time. And, uh, and we thought, okay, we'll get maybe four people to come in and speak and we'll cover, cover the, uh, the, the rest of the course with, uh, with visual material and films and discussions. Uh, well, as it turned out, everyone that we invited accepted our invitation. Um, and so I want to, and accepted their, our invitation by giving us generously of their time. Uh, and uh, because they knew that our goal was to pay it forward when you're involved in something that is significant for you and significant for our students, you have to find a way to get that information to them. And I hope that this has helped. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Virginia. Um, and of course, you know, you are the Brooklyn College connection to West Side Story. Um, okay. So thank you uh, for, you know, making this possible, for uh, making it possible for our students to hear what these professionals in the entertainment industry have had to say. Um, and because a lot of information is in those segments. So I welcome all of you. I've put it in the chat to please visit um, the link. And basically, if you type in West Side Story, the Brooklyn Connection, it comes up and past segments are there. And so for students in particular, there's a lot of information that you should have in terms of writing and music and where to go and, and you know, what to do and how to get out there. So um, again, thank you for joining Pearl's West Side Story uh, lecture series. Uh, we thank you for being with us. And, uh, you know, next semester, we're hoping that you will come back and we can have a full fledged discussion on what's uh, you know, how you perceive the new film in light of the, the old one, the 1961 version. And the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, I put it in the chat, is also having a session, a critical session. Um, the love-hate relationship will be shining at 3 o'clock on Monday, December 13th at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. If you look it up, you'll find it there. Uh, and so Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral is also a part of that panel discussion. So again, thank you for joining us. Be well. Happy holidays, and I look forward to being able to, to see more movies uh, and, you know, screenwriters, directors who are of Latinx descent and uh, telling those wonderful stories. Be well. Adios.